All right, thank you, Ali, for that uh, number three speech. <laughs> uh, good morning again. Um, so, as many of you know, this conference actually started previously named as the Spark Summit or Spark and AI Summit. And this talk will be going back to the roots of the uh, con original conference, Apache Spark. Um, so three years ago at this conference, we poll 100 of you and we ask, what were the biggest challenges you had with Apache Spark? All right, so about 100 of you. And here's what the 100 of you told us. By far the number one was, hey, I have a bunch of Scala users. They're in love with Spark. It's great. But I also have a whole bunch of Python users out here. As a matter of fact, there's way more of them. And they really doesn't get Spark. Spark's kind of clunky. It's difficult to use in Python. Um, it's not a great tool for them. And the number two is everybody else was that, hey, um, I love Spark. I've been using it. I'm using Scala also. But dependency management or my Spark application is a nightmare. And version upgrades are takes six months, one year, three years, you name it. Um, and then there's a consensus among the language framework developers out there, not a huge population, but very important component of the Apache Spark community would tell us, hey, because of that tight JVM language uh, sort of nature of Spark, it's very, very difficult to interact with Spark outside of a JVM as a framework developer, not just as an end user. So we got to work. <laughs> um, and let's talk about the first one. Spark is Scala, but my users is only Python. All right. If you've been to this conference uh, in the past, you know this is not the first time um, we're talking about Python. But I found this video from about three years ago, um, just the other day, as I was preparing the talk. And it's from uh, Zach Wilson, who used to be a data engineer at Airbnb. And here's what Zach has to say. Another one is Spark is actually native in Scala. So writing Spark jobs in Scala is the native way of writing it. So that's the way that Spark is the most likely to understand your job, and it's not going to be as buggy. So Zach, Scala, is, I believe Zach is actually maybe somewhere sitting here. Uh, but Scala is the native way of writing Spark, and writing is not as buggy. So it's not just the people at this conference saying that. right? We got to work um, three years ago at this conference. I think it might have still been named Spark and AI Summit back then. And the uh, theme of all the slides were uh, white background instead of dark background. We talked about the uh, Project Zen initiative by the Apache Spark community. And it really focused on the holistic approach to make Python a first class citizen. And this includes API changes, including better error messages, debuggability, performance improvements, you name it. Right? It comes with almost every single aspect of the development experience. Um, 2022, two years, late, uh, two years earlier, uh, we gave a progress report and talked about all the different improvements we have done in those two Spark releases. And last year, we show a concrete example of how much autocomplete have changed just out of the box from Spark 2 all the way to Spark 3.4. So um, and this slide summarizes um, a lot of the key important features for PySpark in Spark 3 and Spark 4. And if you look at them, it really tells you that Python is no longer just a uh, so bolt on onto Spark, uh, but rather a first class language. And there's actually many Python features that are not even available. They are Python native, Python idiomatic. They are not available in Scala. For example, you could define Python user defined uh, table functions these days and use that to connect to arbitrary data sources. And this is actually a much harder thing to do in Scala. At this conference alone this year, we had more than eight talks talking about various features of just PySpark itself. So a lot of work have gone into it. Um, but how much benefit are the users seeing? Um, again, this is one of those moments I will tell you. I can tell you nonstop about it. But it's the best. You try it out yourself. It's actually a completely different language. Um, when you look at the last 12 months alone, um, PySpark has been downloaded by over 200 countries and regions um, in the world, just according to PyPy stats. And I was doing some number analysis the other day. I was really surprised to find this number. Um, just on Databricks alone for Spark versions 3.3 .3 and above. So it does not include any of the earlier Spark versions, which is a lot of them out there. But just for Spark 3.3 .3 versions and above on Databricks, um, our customers have run more than 5 billion PySpark queries every day. I mean, to give you a sense of that scale, um, the 
I think the leading cloud data warehouse runs about 5 billion queries a day on SQL. Um, this is actually matching that number. This is only a portion, a small portion, of the overall PySpark workloads. Um, but the coolest thing was, as I found the earlier video from Zach, um, in which he said, hey, Scala is a native way of doing it. I found another video he published just about three months ago. By the way, I've never met Jack, uh, Zach until like last week when I uh, call him, reach out to him, ask, hey, would it be OK for me to show you the video? But let me play you this video from this year by Zach. Uh, but things have changed in the data engineering space. Uh, the Spark community has gotten a lot better at about supporting Python. So if you are using Spark 3, the differences between PySpark and Scala Spark in Spark 3 are there really isn't very much difference at all. So thank you for the endorsement from Zach. <laughs> all right. So if your impression of Spark was, hey, um, Spark is written natively in Scala, that's still true. We love Scala. But if your impression is, hey, if I'm really using Python, I would get super crazy JVM stack traces. I would get terrible error messages. The API is not very idiomatic. Try it out again. It looks completely different from three years ago. Right? And of course, the job's never done. We'll continue working on improving Python for Spark. Uh, but I think it's fairly uh, so reasonable to declare, hey, Python is the first class language of uh, Spark. So now let's talk about the other two uh, prompts, version upgrades, dependency management, and JVM language. Um, now let me dive into a little bit more about why these prompts exist. So the way Spark is designed is that all of the Spark application you write, your ETL pipelines, your data science analysis tools, your notebook uh, logic that's running, um, runs in a single monolithic process called a driver that includes all the core server sides of Spark as well. So all the applications actually don't run on whatever clients or um, servers they independently run on. They run in the same monolithic server cluster. And this is really uh, sort of the essence of the problem because, one, all of this, because they all run in the same process, the applications have to share the same dependency. And not only do they share the same dependency as each other, they share the same dependency as Spark itself. Um, debugging is difficult because in order to attach a debugger, you have to attach the very process that runs all of these things. Um, and now, last but not least, if you want to upgrade Spark, you have to upgrade the server, and you have to upgrade every single application run on the server in one shot. It's all nothing. And this is a very difficult thing to do when they're all tightly coupled. So two years ago at this very conference, uh, Martin and I introduced to you Spark Connect. Um, the idea of Spark Connect is, again, very, very simple at a high level. Why don't you take the data frame and SQL API um, of Spark that's either Python or Scala-centric and create a language agnostic binding for it based on gRPC and Apache Arrow. And this sounds like a very small change because it's just introducing a new language binding and a new API, a language agnostic. But really, it's the largest architectural change to Spark since the introduction of data frames APIs themselves. And with this language agnostic API, um, now everything else runs as clients connecting to the language agnostic API. So we're breaking down that monolith into, you can think of it as microservices running everywhere. And how does that impact end-to-end -end applications? Well, different applications now will actually run as clients connecting to the server. But they are really clients. They're running in their own sort of isolated environment. And this makes upgrades super easy because the language binding is designed to be or bindings designed to be language agnostic and for and backward compatible from API perspective. So you could actually upgrade the Spark server side, say from Spark 3.5 to Spark 4.0, without upgrading any of the individual applications themselves. And then you can upgrade the ap applications one by one as you like at your own pace. Same thing with debuggability. Now you can attach the debugger to the individual application that runs in a separate process anywhere you want without impacting the server, without impacting the rest of the applications. Now, for all of the language developers out there, um, this language agnostic API makes it substantially easier to be building new languages. Just in the last few months alone, um, we have seen sort of community projects that build Go bindings, Rust bindings, c -sharp bindings, all of this. And it can be built entirely outside the project with their own release cadence. So 
One of the most popular programming languages, probably the top two post uh, programming languages for data science, um, are R and Python. Right? Spark has built in Python support. There's also built in R support called Spark R. But the actually, the, the most popular R programming uh, library for Spark is not the built in Spark R. It's a separate project called Sparkly R. And Sparkly R is made by this company called Posit, um, which is actually, I, I was talking to uh, the Posit folks. Uh, behind the stage, and uh, I told them, hey, I think POS is the coolest open source company audience I've never heard of. And the reason you have not heard of it is they renamed themselves fairly recently to POSIT. Um, but the people at POSIT created the most foundational open source projects. For example, Dplyr, the very project that defined the grandma for data frames that we're all enjoying today, ggplot, the visual grandma visualization, RStudio, the most popular R IDE. Um, Wes McKinney, who created Panda, works at POSIX. Um, and also Apache Arrow. Um, so I would actually like to welcome Tarif, president of POSIX, onto stage to talk to you more about Sparkly R. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's very kind of you. We, uh, I'm very excited to be here. And thank you, Databricks, for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to speak to this audience. We, as a company, are probably some people that you don't know. You've never heard of us until uh, he gave you a little bit of update. But we are a public benefit corporation. We've been around for about 15 years. Our focus is very much about code first data science. Uh, the, uh, our governance structure is one that allows us to think about things for a very, very long term. So our ambitions are actually to be around for the long haul and to continue to invest in these open source tools. We have been, we support hundreds of R packages, and we also support the RStudio IDE. And if, you, if you've been watching us for a while, you may have noticed that over the last five years, we've added a lot of capabilities to the Python ecosystem, right? So uh, in some cases, these are multi, multilingual uh, solutions. So things like Quarto, Shiny for Python, Great Tables, all of these are examples of, of projects that we have. And we have more that are coming out over the coming years. The, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm having a hard time reading this slides. In 2016, we released a package called Sparkly R. And the reason we released it is because we wanted to have an idiomatic implementation for, uh, for, for the R users that is more aligned with what the tidyverse is. And for those of you who don't know what the tidyverse is, it's like a philosophy of how you write packages and, uh, and the patterns that sort of go along with that. The original design of Spark made it so that for users in corporations in particular to be able to use it, they would have to run RStudio and R on the servers themselves. And so you can imagine when Spark, when Spark Connect became available last year, we were very, very excited because it finally solved one of the key problems that we saw, which is like, how do you make it so that the end user through a client does not have to get into a JVM, can just access it directly? And so happy to say, you know, about, so we started last year. And basically, by the end of last year, we had gotten uh, support for Spark Connect to happen. Uh, Unity Catalog. We worked with the Databricks team to figure out how to make sure that Sparkly R and the IDE had uh, clean support for that. And one of the most interesting things is we added support for R user-defined functions, which is actually a really big deal because now the R users in, the, in, the, in your organizations can actually participate in using Spark to solve the really hard problems. And they can collaborate with other people in the Spark ecosystem. So we're very excited about that. And we're interested in sort of getting people's feedback on that if you get a chance to try it out. So this is very anticlimactic. Those of you who were there yesterday for the demo, you saw Casey. She like the world stopped. We decided to make life easy. It's hard to demo some of these things. But the change, this is the open source desktop IDE. And you can see that it's this one line change that you have to make to be able to connect to Spark Connect. And now this user on the desktop can go ahead and access the Spark cluster and leverage the full capabilities of that. This is one of the key things that we're, we think that will make a big difference in terms of people's ability to contribute and adopt Spark. So 
you probably have noticed, we, we've, we've, over the last year, we've been announcing all kinds of things with Databricks. One of the key things, obviously, were Sparkly R and uh, uh, Spark Connect and support for that. But we have also uh, been making changes on our commercial product. So the first commercial product that we have supporting this is something called Posit Workbench, which gives you a sort of a server-based authoring environment that uh, supports our studio, Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab, VS Code, and ties into the authentication and authorization of those systems. And so you basically get the full power of the governance that you have in Databricks, but having it surfaced to the data scientists. You can expect that over the coming year, you'll be more commercial products and open source tools that will have those tighter, tighter integrations with the Databricks stack. If you're at all curious or interested, you know, feel, feel free to check out any of these links to, to hear, learn about how we're working more with Spark and Spark Connect and how we're working with Databricks. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Tarif. The reason I'm so excited about Spark Connect is that it makes like, uh, so frameworks like Sparkly R possible. It makes it easy to use, makes it easy to adopt, easy to upgrade, easy to build. And this really ultimately benefits all the developers, all the data scientists, all the data engineers out there, because now they can use whatever language they're most comfortable with. It doesn't require all of those to be built into Spark. You will get idiomatic R on Spark. Now, um, with Spark Connect, it's really trying to solve this last two problems, version upgrades, managing Spark, make it easier to be building non-JVM language bindings. With that, it brings us to Spark 4.0. This is actually not a conference in which we'll announce Spark 4.0's release today. It's actually an upstream open source project working at its own pace. But it is coming later this year. To give you a preview of some of the features, just similar to other major version, previous major version releases of uh, Apache Spark, there will be thousands of features I can't possibly go all into today. But Spark Connect will GA um, and become the standard in Spark 4. Um, NC SQL will become the standard in Spark 4. There's a lot of other features that we're looking forward to. But one thing I'm particularly excited about, as at, um, definitely at this conference, is that the, uh, um, the opportunity for the different open source community to be collaborating with each other, um, especially when it comes to compute and storage. So many, many features actually requires code designing the compute stack, which is where Apache Spark comes in, as well as the storage stack, which is where Delta Lake, uh, Linux Foundation, Delta Lake, and Apache Iceberg come in. Um, as a matter of fact, many of the features you've heard about at this conference, at session talks, at keynotes, collations, role tracking, merge performance, variant data type Sean talked to you about, um, type widening, they are not just features in Delta or features in Iceberg or features in Spark. They actually require co-thinking about all three projects um, for them to work. And this is sort of really a spirit um, of open source and the spirit of collaboration in open source. So last week, even though Spark 4.0 is not officially released yet, last week, the Apache Spark community have uh, officially released Spark 4.0 preview. It's not the final release. But it gives you a glimpse into what Spark 4 would look like. Please go to the website, check it out, download it, give it a spin, and let us know your feedback. Thank you very much.